Welcome to 8 o'clock uh, church this morning. My name is Langdon and wherever you're watching this morning, just a special, special welcome to you. As we begin our service this morning, we're looking at uh, our sentence from Psalm 48. Psalm 48 was written as a celebration of the security in Zion and reflects our own security that we have in Christ. Listen to this. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. We're going to start our service with uh, a pre-recorded song, uh, as all the songs will be this morning. And this is from 1867, Walter Smith's Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. What a joy it is to be able to worship together, even though we're on lockdown weekend, to know that we can come together and know that as a church we can come together as watching uh, the service together. is a really encouraging thing. Uh, we as a staff team, as a leadership team, we want to know how you're going. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that if there's any prayer points, any things that uh, can keep us up to date, we'd love to hear that. So of course we have an email address that is connect at myfac.org.au or if you'd like to text, uh, you can send us a text and you can see the number on your screen. And we'd just love to hear how you're going. Uh, it is also a time we're continuing through our series on Mark's Gospel. Shane's going to bring us a special message uh, from Mark's Gospel again today. And if you haven't got a copy of Mark's Gospel, if you've been watching us online uh, and you'd love to get a copy of Mark's Gospels, these are specially written to read for yourself the stories of Jesus. Uh, we'd love to get one out to you. And of course, just send us a message at connect at myfac.org.au. One of the ways we also worship God, as well as through our services, is also through our giving. It's uh, just a way that, as I say, we actually worship God by doing that. We trust in God uh, through our giving. Uh, the money gets used for the work of ministry here at Fig Tree and beyond. And you'll see the bank details there as well, or the details are on our website. Now, it is a bit of a crazy period. A uh, bit of uncertainty going on and so one of the things we will let you know is obviously we'd planned the kids fun day and that was meant to be uh, next Thursday of course uh, under these restrictions that's no longer going to happen but the team has been working hard and they've put together an online kids fun day uh, and if you go to our website figtree.church uh, follow the link there 
uh, in the events and you'll see the Kids Fun Day online. And so that'll just be a great thing uh, to uh, take part in, uh, to have an activity for the kids that can really focus them on Jesus and a great witnessing activity as well. So we commend that to you. There is still a hope to maybe put something on uh, later on on the 12th. The team's working on that, uh, but we're just uh, daily watching those COVID restrictions. Um, the other thing as well uh, is the women's retreat. That is still scheduled for the 23rd and 24th of July. Uh, if you haven't registered, you still can do that. You'll see all the details at the Women's Winter Chill on our events page on our website, figtree.church. If you do want to register, send Joe an email or call us at the office. Uh, and very exciting at the Women's Winter Chill is going to be speaker Jane Thomas. Now, Jane Thomas, uh, former part of our church, but also works for Anglicare. And uh, we just want to mention Anglicare especially because it is a particularly stressful time. It is a time, uh, it's an unusual time that can bring out anxiousness, can bring out different issues. And our partners at Anglicare, our great friends there, are just a great, uh, offer a, a great services to assist us. So if you want to know more or you, you need some assistance, anglicare.org.au is a great place uh, to go and visit. Um, finally, I just want to say we will just keep, uh, keep you updated. Uh, check our newsletter, uh, check our website, uh, check our Thursday updates, uh, and we'll keep you in touch of what's happening uh, as we go through uh, these COVID times that we're in. We are going to keep on trusting God, and we're going to do that as we now do together the Apostles' Creed. Would you join me for that? Say this with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We are going to continue to pray, and during the prayers, I'm also going to pray for NADOC week as we pray. So will you keep praying with me? God of mercy, as we come before you in prayer, Lord, we recognize that you are a merciful God, but we recognize our own sinfulness, Lord. Father, we recognize this morning that you sent your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die in our in our place on the cross. And by doing so, he took the punishment we deserve for our sin, removing it from us as far as from the east is from the west, to offer us that forgiveness as a gift. It's in your mercy we trust. Lord, show us your mercy and grant us your salvation. Lord, we pray for our government, and our state. We lift up to you Scott Morrison 
our Prime Minister, the Premiers of our states. In particular, we lift up Gladys Berejiklian here in New South Wales. We lift up the health ministers, our local governments and councils. Father, we pray that you would continue to give them wisdom as they lead us, especially through this COVID situation. Lord, save the Queen. Mercifully hear our prayers. Father, we also pray for our church, our ministry and our mission. We lift up Anthony, our acting rector, Steve, our acting, other acting rector, uh, who is currently in Lord Howe Island. We lift up Shane and the staff and the wardens. We lift up all our ministry leaders, Lord. Father, we ask that we can continue to encourage each other and keep focused on your mission. Keep co focused on magnifying your name and bringing the gospel to our community and beyond. Father, we lift up our nominators as they continue the search for our next minister. Keep on leading them and guiding them, Lord, to who you would have for us. Lord, clothe your ministers with righteousness and make your chosen people joyful. Father, we lift up our own people. Father, we lift up to you those who are sick, And we bring to mind those we know. We lift up to you those who are grieving, Lord. We pray for peace. Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. And Father, as we pray for peace, we pray for NADOC week with its theme of heal our country. Father, we pray for peace, peace between us as a nation. Father, we thank you for our Aboriginal and our Torres Strait Islander uh, brothers and sisters. Father, we sh uh, confess to you that we as a nation have uh, many areas that are broken in that relationship. Father, may there be peace between us. Show us how we can be agents of healing and seek forgiveness when we haven't been. We thank you for our indigenous brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, we pray that you would strengthen them to keep on following you. And we pray that you would bring more and more of our indigenous brothers and sisters to come to know Jesus too. Father, may this week, during NADOC week, would you increase our capacity to humble ourselves and listen afresh to hear the, the voices and stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Lord, give peace in our time, O oh Lord, for you are our help and strength. And Lord, create in us clean hearts, O oh God, and renew us by your Holy Spirit. Father, through the obedience of Jesus, your servant and your son, you raised a fallen world. Free us from sin and bring us the joy that lasts forever. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to have another time of worship, singing together, I stand amazed in the presence. How marvellous.
That is such a wonderful song. Thank you to our worship team. I love the lyric, When with ransomed in glory, his face I sh- at last shall see, it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. What a wonderful song. We're going to continue our service now, and Kathy Wade is going to bring us the Bible reading. This morning, we're reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 13 to 17. They sent to Jesus some men from the Pharisees and the Herodians to try and catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of truth and that you take no regard for anyone's opinion. For you pay no attention to who they are. No, it's for the sake of truth that you teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay it or shall we not? But Jesus understood their hypocrisy and said to them, Why are you trying to test me? Bring a denarius for me to see. They brought it to him and he said to them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, that of Caesar's. And he said to them, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and that which is God's, give to God. And they were completely amazed at him. Well, if you cast your mind back to the last time you were able to fly somewhere, which I know might have been a little while ago, do you remember soaring through the air at breakneck speed? And as you come to your destination, the pilot obviously tells everyone to prepare for landing. You come in for landing and uh, as you touch down, the reverse thrust comes on and you feel yourself thrown forward in your seat and you feel that great sensation of speed change. Today, as we jump into the next part of Mark's gospel, we have speed change. Mark has dedicated 10 chapters of his gospel to three years of Jesus' life. And you might have noticed some of the language, depending on your translation, you'll see a lot of episodes start with the word now or immediately. And Mark's been trying to say, and now, and now, and now, and now, and this thing is, Mark's kind of been like that uh, year two child who's been on an excursion to the zoo. They come home, first we saw the hippopotamus, and then the elephant, and then we saw the monkey, and then we saw the gorilla, and then we saw the giraffe, and then we saw, and it goes on and on and on, and it's a real, what's called staccato effect, moving quickly, just like your plane. As you arrive to your destination, it slows down. And have you ever felt that feeling as the plane is taxiing and moving to your terminal, you almost feel like I could get out and walk faster than this. Well, Mark spent 10 chapters on three years of Jesus' life, and now he's going to spend six chapters uh, covering just one week of Jesus' life. And the, the 16th chapter is given to Resurrection Sunday, not much said about Saturday. So we have five chapters for five days. Contrast 10 years, uh, three years for 10 chapters and five days in five chapters. Mark wants us to slow down. And so this morning we're gonna take our lead from Mark and I wanna slow down with you. We're gonna slow down in our treatment of the passage that's been read for us this morning and pay some careful attention to some of the things that Mark has to say to us as we go. But here's what I want to say to you. Maybe through this Mark series, there's been a passage where you're like, oh, I can't believe we missed out on that bit. Send an email or a text to our Church Connect and let us know what that passage is. Maybe it's a passage that's always intrigued you. Maybe you've been reading it with a friend and you like more insight on it. Send us a, send us a text on that And uh, we'll work in the next few weeks to bring you a message on a Sunday morning from one of those. I would love to hear what's buzzing around in your mind from Mark's gospel. And uh, we'll try and do something with that over the next few weeks. But back to Mark. So from chapter 11, uh, as we come in with Jesus into Jerusalem, so it's destination Jerusalem. Mark has been moving us really quickly through the last three years of Jesus' life. We've now come to Jerusalem with what's called the triumphal entry. This is a moment where Mark's gospel slows down in speech. Gone are the immediately's, the nows, the nows, the nows. 
And now Mark's going to start to use really time-bound language, uh, even to the point where when Jesus eventually comes to the cross, we'll get updates by the hour, what happened at 9am, what happened at noon, what happened at 3. Throughout this week that takes us from Jesus arriving in Jerusalem to the time of his resurrection, Mark's language will be one where almost on the hour, at least on the day, he brings us updates and he slows down. Gone is the year two child at the zoo and now comes grandpa telling a slow, detailed and directed story. The reason that happens is because indeed we have reached the destination that Mark wants us to be at. We've reached the Passion Week, the week where Jesus moves towards the cross. So everything we read in this part of Mark's Gospel, we can't do without doing it through the lens of Jesus' predictions of his death, which have come from chapter 8 onwards. And we can't do without the looming shadow of the cross bearing over everything that we hear. So I want to encourage you, if you need to pause the service right now, do that. Grab your Bible as I grab mine and uh, let's work through Mark chapter 12 together and see how Mark wants to present this Jesus who we love and worship. Well, Mark opens chapter 12 in verse 13 and he says, They sent to Jesus some men from the Pharisees and the Herodians. Of course, who is the they? Well, the they is an intriguing they. This is the they from the previous episode. It's the scribes. And the chief priests. Now the scribes and the chief priests have just had an encounter with Jesus that has led them to the point of also wanting to kill him. Jesus has told a parable called the parable of the tenants and uh, essentially he has accused them of killing the prophets, rejecting God's will for them and so they are they're violently opposed to Jesus and they're going to look for a safe opportunity to arrest him. What's amazing is the chief priests now, the chief priesthood, the priesthood of, uh, of the Jews at this time was owned by the Jewish sect known as the Sadducees. So these Sadducee chief priests, along with the scribes who are the expert teachers of the law, they send to Jesus some men from the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, this is a strange turn of events. Sadducees and Pharisees by no means are friends. These are rival Jewish sects. They stand for different things. But now such is their determination to see the end of Jesus that they are teaming up together. Moreover, Pharisees and Herodians, we've seen them come together before in Mark's gospel. They too are not friends. They stand for different things. But now we have scribes, chief priests or Sadducees, Pharisees and Herodians, all groups who do not necessarily see eye to eye, see eye to eye in one thing. Jesus of Nazareth, the one who teaches like no one else, who teaches with authority, he must be stopped. He must be killed. So in verse 14, the Pharisees and the Herodians, well, they come to Jesus they come to him and they say, Teacher, we know that you are a man of truth and that you take no regard for anyone's opinion, for you pay no attention to who they are. No, it's for the sake of the truth that you teach the way of God. The Pharisees and the Herodians, who already back in chapter 3, we learnt are seeking and plotting to kill Jesus after they allege that he's violated the Sabbath. They now come to Jesus and they call him, teacher. Now the title they use for Jesus is one worth us noticing again. They call him teacher and this kind of, this is a contrast with what's happened just a few chapters ago in chapter 11 where Jesus has come in, it's his triumphal entry, he's coming to Jerusalem and he's welcomed like a king. He's riding on a donkey. The people are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, he is essentially called the Christ. But now we have quite a contrast. We've gone from a high title, son of David, things like that, to a lower title of teacher. So already there's a bit of a contrast there, but there's also a title that directs us into a particular sphere of inquiry. 
They call him teacher. What they're trying to do is uh, say, look, you as a teacher of the law, you as a teacher, as a rabbi, what do you stand for? Or more importantly here, who do you stand with? Now, the who do you stand with, they begin to answer for themselves. It seems like a compliment because they say, you're a man of truth and you take no regard for anyone's opinion. You pay no attention to who they are. No, it's for the sake of truth that you teach the way of God. It might seem like they're complimenting Jesus, but uh, it seems they're actually working to isolate Jesus. Think about it like this. You're a man of truth. You take no regard for anyone's opinion and you pay no attention to who they are. Just a few chapters ago, the same Pharisees had come to Jesus and they'd asked him a question on divorce. Now, as we hear that, we say, oh, what's Jesus' uh, view? What's his uh, ethic of divorce? They were asking a question that was perhaps more political than it was moral. You see, in their time, there were two very popular rabbinic schools. There was the school of Hillel and there was the school of Shemai. Now, these two rabbis were probably the, the dominant rabbis of the time and their school was the dominant time. They taught different things about what constituted a legal divorce. I think what the Pharisees are doing at that time and what many scholars contend is they were saying to Jesus, okay, teacher, so do you line up with Hillel or do you line up with Shammai? And in that moment, Jesus says, well, I line up with God. I'm standalone. I don't belong to either one of those schools. Here, in their sycophantic words of compliment, they are actually saying to Jesus, do you realize just how alone you are? You take no regard for anyone's opinion. When it comes to Pharisaic teachers of the law, you don't belong to Shammai, you don't belong to Hillel, you are in conflict with the chief priests right now, with the Sadducees. The scribes don't like you either because they're the expert teachers of the law. And back in Mark 2, when you healed that paralyzed man, everyone noted that you don't teach like others. You teach like one with authority. You've upset a lot of the eldership of these people. And you and your God, whoever he may be, you stand alone. You're an isolated man, but such is, their, such is their hypocritical lips that they speak in this way to almost sound like they're, they're goading Jesus into a response, goading Jesus into continue to speak what's truly on his mind and the truth that he believes. But make no mistake, they're saying, Jesus, you're an isolated man. You're in isolation. Now what do you say? Well, within this isolation, remembering that these are a people who have come to Jesus to try and trap him in his words, Mark tells us in the previous episode. They say to Jesus, they lay a trap and they say, is it lawful to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay it or shall we not? Now, despite their uh, huge flattery and things like that, I suspect you don't need to be the Messiah to work out that this is a trap. And indeed, Jesus sees that it is a trap. Verse 15, But Jesus understood their hypocrisy and said to them, Why are you trying to test or why are you trying to trap me? Note that language of hypocrisy. We've heard that before back in Mark chapter 7. It was Jesus who first used the language of hypocrite or play actor of the Pharisees and Herodians. He said, you guys are the guys Isaiah was talking about. You honor with your lips, but your heart is far away. And so perfectly again here, Jesus knows their hypocrisy. Mark wants us to remember that Jesus sees that these are flattering lips, that these are just words. They don't really mean these things. They're laying a trap for him and Jesus is wise to the trap. What is the trap? Well, having pointed out that he's isolated from all the Jewish major groups, they speak of the imperial tax to Caesar. Now, we hear tax and perhaps you think, yeah, I hate paying tax, you know, I pay too high a rate of tax and all that sort of thing. This is an imperial tax to Caesar and 
uh, perhaps it's not just the difference between your gross income and your net income. Perhaps paying an imperial tax to Caesar might speak of your allegiance. You pay the tax to Caesar is a way of also showing that you are aligned with Rome. You reject the tax and you may be saying something very strong in terms of I am not aligned with Rome. There was another Jewish sect known for not being aligned to Rome. We've spoken of scribes, we've spoken of Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. There were also the, the Zealots. The Zealots were known for insurrection. They were known for rebelling, for their zeal for being an Israelite and would often find themselves in battles and wars, maybe not often, but from time to time in wars against Rome. Perhaps when they ask about this imperial tax, they're saying, so maybe you're a zealot. You're not one of us. Maybe you're a zealot. Maybe you're one of these rebels against Rome. Now, Jesus understands the hypocrisy and he says, why are you trying to trap me? Because Jesus understands this is a trap. You know what I've said. And now perhaps they're asking, perhaps they're saying to Jesus, look, you can rebel against us. And we'd like to kill you and arrest you, but we fear the people. Uh, that would be a problem for us. Also, we fear Rome. If we start uh, executing people, we'll be in trouble with Rome. So Jesus of Nazareth, you can rebel against a Pharisee and get away with it. Jesus of Nazareth, you can rebel against a chief priest and get away with it. Jesus of Nazareth, you can rebel against all of our Jewish leaders and get away with it. But now, isolated Jesus, will you rebel against Rome? What will you say about the imperial tax? Will you rebel against Caesar? Because if you rebel against him, if you rebel against Rome, you won't be protected. You won't be safe in the same way you are when you rebel against us. But their trap's a clever one. Because if Jesus says, no, no, don't pay taxes, then he's in trouble with Rome. If Jesus says, yes, pay the tax, then they may just have found the opportunity to show the people of Israel, oh, Jesus is not your man. Jesus is not the prophet. Jesus is in cahoots with Rome, telling you to pay taxes to Rome. And now they can arrest him without fear from the people. Do you see the trap, the clever, clever trap that they have set for Jesus and tried to goad him into the trap by uh, allegedly complimenting him for being such a speaker of truth? Well, Jesus, seeing the trap, now responds to the trap and he says, bring me a denarius, bring me a coin. Of course, the coin, being currency of Rome, has Caesar's image on it. This is what he says. So they brought him, they brought him the denarius and he said to them, whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, that of Caesar's. And he said to them, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and that which is God's, give to God. Jesus has said something profound here and has spoken of a much greater, greater surrender than they had ever imagined. You see, they say, should we pay tax? And Jesus says, well, it's his coin. It's got his image on it. So return that which bears the image to the one who owns the image. He says, yes, pay the tax. Participate with the government. He says, since it bears his image, give it back to him. But here's the greater surrender he speaks of. If you give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, then give to God that which belongs to God. And so the question is, where is the image of God found? Well, Jesus isn't just speaking to anyone. He's speaking to Pharisees who know the Bible well. He's speaking to you and I, friends, who, who have the Bible and an opportunity to know it well. Where is the image of God born? Where is it found? From the very beginning, in Genesis, we learn that when God created man and woman, he created them as his image bearer. 
So Jesus is speaking of a much greater surrender at this point. He is saying to these Herodians, he is saying to these Pharisees, he's saying to you and I, sure, give to Caesar what bears his image and surrender to God what bears his image. He speaks of this greater surrender and he's saying to these Pharisees and Herodians, to you and I, and surrender your own self to God. Give yourself to God. If you're sweating over giving a coin to the tax man, you haven't, you haven't even approached how far the surrender that is called for. Give your life to God. In fact, Jesus is standing in front of these Pharisees, these Herodians, as the one who has just triumphantly entered Jerusalem as God's Messiah. He's actually saying to them, it's time for you to stop playing games and follow me. What's amazing, what shows Jesus' great and fantastic love is he's actually preparing the Pharisees and Herodians, you and I, for a repentance. He's preparing them for something that's going to be made very clear to them that they will need to surrender to. You see, in just a few days, Jesus will go to the cross. And on the third day after going to the cross, he'll be raised from the grave and he'll appear before them. And now they will see that he is God's son. They'll see that he is the Christ. It will be made very plain to them where God stands before them. And the question will be there for them now. Will you surrender yourself to God? Will you take that greater surrender. The love of Jesus knows no ends because not only does he prepare them intellectually by saying you must realize that the image bearer must be surrendered to the image owner just as the coin returns to Caesar, the human is to be returned to God. Jesus will show them what it looks like. Jesus will show you and I what it looks like. Because just a matter of days after this conversation, Jesus will pray in the garden. He will say to his heavenly father, death is really scary. Take this cup from me. Yet I surrender myself as a human. I surrender as image bearer. I surrender myself unto you, God. And God does what God does. He raises him up. In surrendering himself to God, Jesus loses nothing. He gains his Messiahship. He gains eternal life for all people. He gains being the firstborn among all creation. He gains that first step of fullness where death cannot affect again. Jesus prepares the way. He says, you got to surrender all that you are to God. Jesus prepares the way. He says, watch me do it first. Friends, in this episode with Jesus and the Pharisees and the Herodians, Jesus has taught us of a much greater surrender than simply paying tax. Jesus has perhaps worked to calm the, the anxiety of a Pharisee and calm the anxiety of you and I. He said, look, when you surrender yourself to God, you don't need to worry about allegiances. You already have a greater allegiance. You're surrendered to God. And because you're surrendered to God, you'll be clear when it comes to working with the government where you should stop. But you'll also be free to be a fruitful citizen, to pay your taxes, to obey your COVID laws, to not speed, to do all the things that government has asked you to do as a, as a law-abiding citizen without somehow idolizing the government because your allegiance is already to God. So you're free to be obedient and clear on when to stop. Jesus' greater surrender speaks of allegiance to God. Jesus' greater surrender speaks of real security. Sometimes we're very fearful of handing over our taxes, very fearful of surrendering the things that are ours, for they are our security. But Jesus is saying, you know, when you're surrendered to God, you're now owned by God and God takes care of his stuff. 
This was his lesson we heard last week to that rich young man. Sell everything you own, come follow me. You won't be destitute. You'll be my possession. What's better, to have your possessions or to be one of mine? I would suggest to you that to be a possession, to be owned by the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills is a far more affluent life, a far more secure life than anything you could possibly own. Jesus says, surrender yourself to God, Pharisee. Surrender yourself to God, Herodian. Surrender yourself to God, chief priest. Surrender yourself to God, Shane. And true security is found there. Jesus says, surrender yourself to God. And when you are owned by God, something changes about all the things you have. You move from being an owner to being a custodian. And when you're a custodian, it means that someone else has a say in the directing of affairs. If God owns me, then he owns all the things I have. If God owns me, then the things that are in my hands are not my possessions, but things I am in custody of. Won't I have more confidence? to follow the direction of the one who tells me where to surrender those things, how to use those things for his glory. When I have more confidence, when I know that he who put these things in my hands will not leave me empty handed, but as he directs my affairs, will take care he is a God of providence. In answer to the Pharisees and the Herodians questions, in answer to our questions of, What should I give up? What should I hold on to? Jesus says, here's where it starts. Surrender yourself to God. Give all that you are and all that you have to him. And your allegiance will be sure. You'll be one of his. Your security will be sure because you'll be owned by him. And you will experience a wonderful liberation in how you manage your possessions because you will no longer be an owner. You'll have the joy of being a custodian of the things that belong to the God of all the earth. Psalm 24, verse one. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let me pray. Gracious heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus. We thank you for the wisdom that he bestows upon us as he teaches us how to do life well. More than that, Father, we thank you that uh, indeed these words came just days before he went to the cross before he came out of the empty tomb and secured an eternal future for all who hand themselves over to him. And so, Father God, this morning, I pray for each and every one of us that we will be liberated by your Holy Spirit to give ourselves wholly to Jesus as image bearers to return ourselves to the Lord to pledge our allegiance to him and know the freedom and the security that is in that. And to delight not in ownership, but in custodianship, that we might know that God will give us what we need and we delight in him directing us in how to use it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So good to worship, isn't it? Let us finish the service with the blessing. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. We're so glad you could join us this morning. I hope this has been an encouragement and uh, I hope that you have a really wonderful day.